feel like this video is gonna be sad. This is a question that I get all the time, so I feel like I just need this to be up there. Hey guys, what's up? It's Paige Leal here. You may know me from TikTok. You can follow me there at Paige Leal. Also check out my Instagram with the same name. While you're at it, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Click the bell icon to get notified when I upload new videos. Give it a like, give it a little comment, you know, do all the good stuff. But a question I get all the time is how did I get diagnosed? When was I diagnosed? What was the diagnosis process like? I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna go over all of that right now. But before we get into the video, I need to talk about and thank the sponsor for this video, Cerebral. As May is mental hunt, mental, as May is mental, what? What? As May is Mental Health Awareness Month, I think this is an awesome company that is doing really great things in terms of accessibility and in making mental health seem like less of a taboo thing. Cerebral is a mental health platform that provides clients with access to ongoing online medication management, therapy, for anxiety, depression, insomnia, etc., all for a flat monthly rate. There's a huge accessibility problem in this whole field, and so I love that Cerebral is all online. You can schedule meetings and visits with your provider completely on your schedule and in the comfort of your own home. They make sure that your therapist and your doctor are constantly in communication so you are getting the best overall care. This also isn't intended to be just one of those quick fixes, but they really work and strive for developing and helping you create a long-term treatment plan. And also it can cost three times less than other traditional therapies. I know for me, it can be really difficult to go into a new space in general or be able to go outside in public to get myself help. It's really important to me that this is an opportunity for me to receive the treatment that I need in my most comfortable space. Sometimes you can see someone in as little as 20 minutes using their instant live visits option. You can start by filling out a short online form, answering a few questions to help them understand what symptoms you're having. From there, you can choose one out of the three membership options based on your needs or on your budget. The plans include medication and care counseling, medication and therapy, and therapy. The medication delivers monthly and with free shipping. And these plans include monthly voice calls and unlimited messaging with your care counselor or a licensed therapist. If you'd like to take the next step in working on your mental health, you can click the link in the description, answer the questionnaire, and get connected with the provider right away. Your first month is only $30. Thank you again, Cerebral, for reaching out to me and for giving my followers this awesome opportunity that I really hope that a lot of them can utilize. And without further ado, to our regular scheduled programming. Now, every time I talk about this with my followers, which has only been short TikTok videos or TikTok lives, I kind of feel bad. I think I know what you guys want. I think that a lot of you are like, I think I'm autistic. I don't know what the next steps are. And from that, I, I, I wish that I could be a better service than I am. But I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna tell you guys about my experience and uh, hopefully it helps you. And also hopefully, you know, helps you know a little bit more about myself. I just wanna put out kind of like a little trigger warning. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about any of these things, but what I am gonna talk about is um, suicide attempts. And so I want that to be out there. And also I'm gonna be talking about the diagnosis process and that includes talking to doctors and hospitals. So that's a little content warning for y'all. But anyway, we'll get started on my diagnosis process. It was five and a half years ago. So I was 15 at the time, I had just turned 15 and I was still doing dance classes. We had dance classes throughout the summer to keep our, you know, technique good. But I remember when I was 15 just and 14, just having the worst time in my life. Like just so stressed and overwhelmed about everything, stressed about everything. Grades were so important to me, but so was everything else. I was a, a, an intense overachiever. I still am, but I'm just not in school anymore. So it's, it's good. I never considered myself depressed. I still don't consider myself depressed. I was diagnosed with depression, but for me, it's that I am just so stressed, so overwhelmed. I just want things to stop. Did I want to unalive myself? Absolutely. But it wasn't because I was sad. It was because I wanted things to stop. I wanted to stop thinking. I thought that I was an alien. I thought that I was a weirdo. I thought that I was messed up and unfixable and not, nothing works, nothing is good. So my mother picked me up from dance and I guess I was being worse off than I usually was. And I think that night was my breaking point. And my mom picked me up from dance and she could tell I was not okay. And she said, are you going to hurt yourself tonight? And I said, I don't know, maybe. Probably. And my mom said, do you want to unalive yourself? And I'm like, yes, every day. She's like, will you do that tonight? I'm like, I don't know, maybe. 
I had a plan, like I had a plan for a long time. I just wanted everything to be done. And so my mom said, well, then we are not taking you home. We're gonna take you to the hospital. Every time you get admitted into the hospital, they ask you the same questions. Like, do you have a plan? Well, we wanna keep you here for about two weeks to make sure you're not gonna die. I had to talk to a guy named Justin and I remember his name. He had piercing blue eyes and he looked like my grade five teacher. And he was like, I'm a psychiatrist and we're gonna talk about what you're feeling. Honestly, my brain was really fried for most of it, just considering uh, burnout. Looking back on it, I can call it burnout. So I was really stubborn. I suspected that I had anxiety, depression, and OCD, and I figured that sounds good. And then he said, we wanna keep you here at least overnight for observation and to keep yourself safe. And I said, get me out of here. I hate hospitals. Hospitals are disgusting and they don't help you when you're in there for mental health reasons. Like they don't give you any sheets. They don't give you any pillows. They make you have the light on and the door open with a security guard standing at the door the whole time. Like, oh yes, this makes me really not want to unalive myself. This is perfect. You're like barely allowed to have your cell phone. You can't have a pen and I'm a writer. Like I need to write and I couldn't have a pen. So anyway, I was like, please get me out of here. And he's like, well, are you going to hurt yourself today? And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, hey, if you say, I don't know, we're going to keep you in here. And so I'm like, hey, fuck, I promise I'm not going to hurt myself today. <laughs> really, I would say anything to get me out of that stupid place. Went home. I went home, but this really sparked a big thing for my parents. Like they were like, you are obviously not okay. So we got to figure you out. So we booked an appointment with my doctor. Just so you guys know, I am in Canada. So everything that I received is free for me. Some things like private therapists aren't free but everything that I went through in this situation was free, which is why having a, getting a diagnosis is also such a privilege because in a lot of countries, even considering in Canada, if you wanna get diagnosed, a lot of the time you have to pay for it and it's thousands of dollars. And for a slip of paper, for something that you probably already know you have, it doesn't matter that much to people. So I have I don't see a problem with being self-diagnosed as anything. As long as you're doing an appropriate amount of research in the right places, I have no problem with it. If someone does have a problem with it they just didn't have enough they didn't have enough acceptance for that community in the first place that they think that there's like a limited amount that they need to prioritize who they give acceptance to so anyway we book an appointment with my doctor and he we talked to him about stuff mostly my mom talked because i shut down a lot with authority figures but he ended up giving me this document to fill out in regards to seeing a child psychiatrist his name is dr david d templeman and i'll always remember that name i believe he was either from somewhere in england or somewhere in british columbia <laughs> but i do believe he had like a similar accent to mine so maybe he was from british columbia he was not from around here and so in order to talk to him i had to meet via like a zoom conference but it wasn't a zoom conference because i don't think zoom like existed in 2015. i had to fill out all these forms and um the forms like the, in it, it said like you had to explain what was wrong with you or what why you wanted to see the, uh, the D dr templeman what like is the urgency is there any urgency and i think that so there was a whole space for what you're feeling like whatever you want to talk about and I'm a big writer and I think that my doctor expected that I would fill this page up and I just wrote, I want to die, help me please. And I think that that's what got me in so fast. Usually this process takes a few months to a few years to even have you to talk to a child psychiatrist, but I think that that was really severe especially considering like my typical behavior my doctor knew that that was not okay <laughs> so it was only a couple of weeks that i then got in to see dr david d templeman I'm giving you guys his name because maybe this is someone that you're interested in one thing about this doctor guy though i knew going in that i would not like him because he'd written a bunch of books on children with anxiety and like how to not make sure your kid doesn't get anxiety as they get older and one of the things that really made me mad, he said that if your kid, you know, kids always ask why, 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 you just say, because I said so. That's not where it'll work, especially for someone with my brain. If my parents said, um, Paige, don't do that. I go, why? They say, because I said so. I go, okay, I'm going to go fucking do it then. And like, I remember one time I ran away from my mom in the grocery store and I turned the corner and my mom freaked out. And I was like, why are you freaking out? And she's like, because if I don't see you, how will I know if someone took you? And what if I, someone takes you and I never see you again? And I was like, oh shit, that makes sense. My parents always treated me like I was their equal. 
like I deserved to know the same things that they did. The hard thing came from when I ended up being a lot smarter than my parents, sorry guys, because I always had all these questions that they couldn't answer. And then that's when they bought me a billion books. I was really mad at David D. Templeman for saying that. So I was like, I'm gonna go into this fucking thing and I'm not gonna like this guy. Cause in like the documents, he said like, read my book. I was like, what an asshole. I don't wanna read your book. Like we had to go through the hospital. And so we went through, like we're in the hospital. We had to go to a separate spot. And uh, my mother's with me cause he wanted my, like a parent to be there as well. My father is with our family, but my father is like never involved in anything. He just does his own, own thing. So my dad was not there. I was sitting here, my mom was sitting here and there was this big like TV monitor on a stand. And we were in a room alone and it was kind of a small room. And I imagined that he turned on the camera so he could observe me long before I could actually see him because I think it was half an hour that I was sitting there with my mom and bef before his face came up and a lot of the things that he talked about at the end were things that I did before I could even see his face. Very smart, very good on you. But I remember the curtains, I had to get up and touch the curtains and touch the blinds and I had to do it with both hands and I remember touching lots of stuff. I was touching the chairs, I was bouncing my legs, I was moving my hair a lot. Um, before just getting very very stressed. He came up on the screen and I remember that in the background there was just lots of stuffed animals and I remember there was one panda bear and because panda bears are my favorite animal and I said I have a stuffed panda bear as well. He said do ya? I said yes and then we spent the next three hours in agony. I was getting drilled with questions. It was just question after question after question and I was crying and I was hyperventilating and he's and, and every everything I did he had like a backup question. Like he's like, why are you crying? I'm like, because you're yelling at me. Why do you think I'm yelling at you? Because your voice is raised and your eyebrows look like this. And he's like, why do you think that means that I'm yelling at you? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. And he's like, why are you not looking at me? Because I can't hear you when I'm looking at you. Like, why are you touching it like that? I don't know. And I was so stressed. He had to take breaks from me sometimes to talk to my mom about things. Cause my mom was a little more put together than I am. Cause my mom is neurotypical. And then at the very end, it was like, he just went, Okay, Paige, let's talk. How did you all of a sudden become a nice guy? But anyway, he just said, so here's, here's the deal. You obviously have anxiety and depression and OCD. And I was like, beautiful, stunning, love that for me. Kind of what I figured, that's kind of what I thought. And he's like, but there's a, there's a bigger thing here. You have autism. And I just remember my heart just going, what's autism? <laughs> I'm like, what's that? And he's like, well, Sheldon Cooper from Big Bang Theory. And I'm like, what a coincidence. Big Bang Theory is my favorite TV show. He said, you are Sheldon Cooper, but smarter. I'll always remember that. And I said, he's a, he's a quantum physicist, so I'm not smarter than him. And he said, you're smarter than him because you have learned over the years how to act normal. He's like, it took me a bit to break you down. And once I broke you down, I could see it clear as day and we talked for three hours and for you know two and a half of those three hours I was being fully my autistic self and he's like so clear and the things that my mother was saying about my childhood like he's like I can't believe that no one noticed until now like he said it's called autism spectrum disorder and he said that previously I would have been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome which is not in the DSM-5 it's in the DSM-4 and we were using the DSM-5 at the time but he just wanted to like put let me know that it's like the smart autism, but autism spectrum disorder is your diagnosis. But don't feel bad about it. It's cool, girl, you're smart. So I left there with this new knowledge of being autistic. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? But I know that right after I really, like it, 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 it was a lot, it was a big change. My mom and I cried the whole drive back home. And we just said that we wish that we had recorded what he said afterwards. Cause he spent like a good hour talking to us about what it meant. We were both like, what, it, what does that mean? What do we do? The first thing I did was I saw my boyfriend that night. My boyfriend at the time, he's not my boyfriend anymore. You'll see why. And I told him and he said, don't tell anybody else because I don't want to be known as the guy who's dating the uh, R word. So I didn't tell anybody for another year and a half when we then broke up and then I started telling people and then that's when I started accepting it. That whole year and a half after I was diagnosed to when my boyfriend and I broke up, I was just hiding it. I was not accepting it. I was treating everything like everything was normal. Like I think that I was, I knew, you know, sometimes, oh, I'm getting anxious about this thing, but that's okay. 
I'm autistic, I'm not broken. But then after we broke up, I finally felt comfortable with telling people and I told my close friends first. They all were like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes so much sense. One of my best friends said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I went, you know? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it's clear as day. And I think that that's when I started really looking into what autism was. I still felt uncomfortable telling the world and I only told people that were close to me just because I thought that they could help and also because of ableism. You get treated so much differently when people know you're autistic. I, I think I was probably around, I don't know, like when I was in grade 12 that I really started accepting it and figuring it out. The medication that I started taking in grade 11, I was a complete zombie for months. I was doing horribly, like just trying to get used to this medication. I was high for like three months straight. Like things would move and shift and morph. And I remember going to see my therapist. And when this was happening, I was like, girl, like everything is moving. She, she wanted me to sit on the floor and do yoga with her. Yoga has never worked for my autistic brain. They're like, empty your mind. I'm like, no, I can't believe neurotypical. Sometimes you guys just like don't have thoughts. Like your guys, like your brain, are, your brains are just empty. Like my brain is constantly, 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 constantly going fast. I fired that therapist and <laughs> I found out more about autism and finally let it really become a part of me. And everything kind of made sense. And I remember my mom, I was at the trailer with my mom and she was vacuuming and she was like, I don't know what is wrong with you, but you were acting so much more autistic now than you ever have. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I am. Like, I think this is just, I think this is me. And she's like, no, you're, you're faking it. You're playing it up. And now that my mom and I look back on it, we both know that that was because I finally, you know, I, I didn't have the mask as much in front of my parents. And so I let myself be more myself. And of course, at first I was subject to criticism, but now it's so much better. I had no actual real relationship with anybody except like maybe like close, close, close friends I'd known for years. You're 16 years old and your mother has no idea who you are. I had to create a whole new relationship with my mom, with my brother and, and be like, this is who I am. All of those years of people that just couldn't tell that I was autistic or, or didn't know. That's basically the story of how I got diagnosed with autism. I really hope that that helped some of you maybe feel less alone. I'm glad I could have that up on my YouTube page for people to refer back to if they'd like to know. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for caring. I love you all so much. You guys are so cool. Thank you so much. I love you. Bye.